elders, I request all of them to please come and occupy their chairs. We are about to start the session. Uh, this is a special session uh, by the Andhra Pradesh Ophthalmological Society. Uh, this is called the commemorative session. Uh, each specialty uh, is one, uh, one of our member. They, they sponsored this session. So each year we'll be recognizing one person in that particular field and then we'll invite them to give us the lecture. Now in this hall, we have the uh, three Dr. Siva Ramakrishnan sir's refractive surgery lecture. This year, we're fortunate to have Dr. Rupal Shah here to deliver this lecture. Then followed by Dr. Sri Svanti Sriram's uh, lecture and uh, none other than our president is going to deliver this year. And then Dr. G. Sundar Ram Raju's lecture, uh, another uh, famous uh, refractive surgeon uh, from this area or the state, uh, Dr. K. P. Redigar, sir. And then the uh, uh, Dr. Raman Raju's uh, corneal lecture by Samar Basak, sir. And then the uh, Learn from Masters, uh, Anapati Narayan Reddy's uh, commemorative lecture and then the most deserving person, uh, our um, beloved uh, Dr. S. Chandrasekhar sir, he was the founder of the Srikaran Institute of Ophthalmology in Katinada. To start with, now I invite Dr. Rupal Shah, please come on to the dais. Dr. Madhavi, can you accompany her? Dr. Sivaram Krishnan sir was the senior most ophthalmologist uh, from Vijayawada. Uh, and then, uh, thank you, madam. Please come and take the seat. Sivaram Krishnan sir was the uh, very uh, senior most and then the famous uh, ophthalmologist from the Vijayawada and uh, he passed away uh, a few years back. Then his son, Dr. Chakravarti, is now actively uh, running the hospital. And he was a great person who has contributed a lot to the Andhra Pradesh Combined State Ophthalmological Society. On his name, we started refractive surgery lecture. This year, we are uh, allotting to Dr. Rupal Shah. To introduce Dr. Rupal Shah, madam, she was a... Uh, great inventor. She was in a refractive surgeon since uh, 1994, almost uh, three decades. And then the first person in the world to do one incision that is called the smile, the pioneer and early investigator who helped develop the technique of uh, the smile. First in the world to use circle software in a patient for recruitment in smile. Trained more than 2,000 two ophthalmologists from across the world. Last month conducted successfully the intensive LASIK training course attended by 20 ophthalmologists each time. Many national and international publications and pres presentations. Was invited a faculty to subspecialty days of the AAO in 2020 and recipient of many awards and gold medals. And they fondly described as the mother of the smile. With these few words of introduction, now I request our president dr gr redigar to hand over a plaque to madam on her apos behalf Now I request Madam to deliver the Dr. Sivaramakrishnan's lecture. Good morning. Gives me great pleasure to be here. Uh, I thank the APOS for this honor and also everybody present here uh, in this early morning. 
This is the first time I've seen her session starting before time. So it is really one of the firsts again. I'm going to be talking about a revolutionary procedure called SMILE. SMILE has a past. It has definitely a present and a very bright future. So I think uh, without much ado, I would just start with the main topic, SMILE, Aj, Kal, Aj or Kal. Is the slide forwarding? Uh, I must confess that I'm uh, I'm a financial. Uh, I, I'm actually the pr person who helped Skull's Eyes develop the Smile procedure, and I'm still a consultant with them. Uh, it's it's a big honor and very humbling to be given this Dr. K. Sivarama Krishna's uh, refractive surgery lecture. A great personality like this uh, don't come often, and to be able to follow the footsteps of such great personalities is good enough to be leading your life. There is a very nice saying by Mark Twain. He has said that there are only two important days in your life, the day you are born and the day you find out why. And most of us here know why we are born now. We have found our calling and that's what we are following. So thank you very much for the honor. If we talk about the past of SMILE, it began in 2006 when Secundo and Bloom commenced their first lenticular extraction procedures way back in 2006. They performed the first SMILE procedure but with multiple incisions. We got the baton from there in 2008 and I started doing smile procedure with single incision in 2008. The improvement in visual recovery happened by 2009, and the first commercial sales happened by 2010. The US FDA, as it, as, uh, it is, took too long. 2016, it got approval. And by 2018, more than one million procedures were performed all across the world, which says a lot about the procedure. In 2023, now a new model of Isumex laser has been launched with higher frequency and a host of other features. And new platforms from Webbot and Zima are launched performing similar procedures. So it is definitely a way to go in future. It, it began in Germany uh, in, and they first published their study in 2006. They did 250 eyes, they showed that the procedure was feasible, was accurate, but their vision recovery was very slow to compete with LASIK. And at Center for Sight, New Vision Laser Center, we started the studies in August 2008. In our initial eyes, we were extremely surprised by accuracy of the result. And at one year, we had more than 95% of the first eyes within plus or minus 0.5 diopters, which in itself was a feat. This was without any nomogram adjustment and with the old laser, the first thousand eyes probably done in the world. Of course, since no one had performed single incision smile before, we needed to even design the instruments to perform it. However, we also noticed a long visual recovery period. This is the way uh, it was getting done in initially as a flex procedure where we would have one pass of the femtosecond laser posteriorly going from inside out, followed by a side cut. The second pass would come more anteriorly from outside in and meeting in the center. And this was followed by a whole flap-like incision. So you could open the flap and peel out the lenticule under vision. And this was how it began. And you can see that the opening was pretty easy, though you could mistake the upper and the lower portions. But with experience, uh, you can de definitely make out. Also, the laser is attached with a surgical microscope. So if you are in a dilemma, you can always check on that. There is also a slit lamp attachment. So that also helps to delineate the edges. Uh, and this is how we were just 
peeling out the lenticule and putting the flap back. Now, once we got the hang of this, we started doing something which was known as a pseudo smile, where we, we would make the whole flap but not open it completely and try and remove it through a small opening that we would make. And finally, we went on to one incision smile. I didn't really like two, three, four incisions. In our initial studies, we started with flex, very quickly went on to uh, the smile. Uh, but since uh, our first 50 smiles, uh, we published in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery in January 2007, uh, 2010, which was the first publication of smile with a single incision. We also observed slow vision recovery, and that was a matter of great concern, especially in the, since the origin was not known. So we tried several different things to know what could be the cause. We tried putting steroids in one drop and not in the other. We tried putting a bandage contact lens in one eye and not in the other. We even tried to do a PTK on the surface, thinking that maybe uh, it would be the irregularity that is left on the surface, but nothing seemed to be working. And one fine day, we suddenly have an insight uh, it was like a eureka moment when we discovered that in some patients we could actually judge which ones would do better the next day. So we went and saw those videos and we could see that there was a big accumulation of bubbles in the ones which were not recovering that well. And this led us to the understanding of the cause of poor, poor visual recovery, which was like this, that when you put the first layer of the of first pass of the laser, you get a uniform cut like this. But soon these gas bubbles would coalesce, so the tissue above gets distorted, and the second layer then passes through this distorted tissue. And therefore, when you remove this particular lenticule, you would have the top being irregular, and this would also sometimes reflect in the topography. But since epithelium is a big helper, it just smoothens out these irregularities over a period of time. And we had found that over a period of time, everybody did well. So we simply suggested to change the scanning pattern from the one where we were beginning in the center to the one where we started uh, beginning, uh, where we were ending in the center. We suggested something where we started in the center and ended in the, uh, center, uh, in the periphery. And this really helped. So simply changing the pattern from this, where we, st we were starting in the center, going to the periphery in the posterior part, followed by a side cut. And the second pass was starting from periphery, allowing a lot of bubbles to accumulate in the center, as you can see there. So by the time the second pass would reach the center, it would go through a lot of distortion and therefore you would have a very distorted anterior surface delaying the vision recovery. So it's simply changing the pattern like this, where we scan from the periphery to the center, followed by a side cut of the lenticule. The, we had the 200 kilohertz laser at that time. So it was quite slow and it was actually allowing a lot of bubbles to get accumulated. And now you can see very little bubble was accumulated when we started the second pass. And this made all the difference. While we had only 65% unchanged or gained vision at one week, simply changing the pattern gave us 83% uh, having unchanged or gained, and 94% unchanged or gained at six months changed to 98%, which was a game changer. That led to the understanding and therefore a lot of improvements. The change in the frequency from 200 to 500 kilohertz was again a big step because that made the laser very fast. Increase in the spot spacing, improvement in laser spot quality. And as a result of all these interventions, SMILE today has visual recovery, which is similar or sometimes even better to a femtolasic procedure. And in our practice today, we are surprised if next day the patient doesn't reach best corrected vision or better. So now the standard technique is to have a one incision which can vary from two to five millimeters. The position also can be varied to the place you want to keep it. And you can easily find the two planes. You can see the bubble pattern to be very smooth. And you'll find that it's almost a no effort technique where you just go in 
swipe with a very blunt instrument. You don't even need any special instruments. And simply go to the bottom now and, and separate the lenticule. And it's actually waiting for you to call it out. So you can grasp it from the edge of the incision and remove it without disturbing any architecture and therefore the vision recovery is almost instantaneous. So from very next day, patient goes back to work, similar to or even better sometimes, with no much extra care required. So the current focus now is for increasing the surgical ease while maintaining the speed of visual recovery. The ultimate idea is to have free-floating lenticule to reduce the, the uh, learning curve. And if you can just simply pull it out of the stromal poc pocket. But creating a free lenticule requires tighter spot spacing. More spots means more time and therefore requires a higher frequency laser. And also a reduction in time to complete the whole procedure. There comes the role of Visumax 800, which is now has these features along with a lot other features. But the remarkable aspect of SMILE, which is predictability, accuracy, stability, and safety, has not changed or changed very little since the first study. Now we have better energy, spot parameters, different scanning patterns, higher frequency and better surgical techniques and instrumentation. And all across the world, more than 98% of the eyes are within plus or minus 0.5 diopters. So this is where we stand today. What is the future? Till now, we had only one platform which was available, the Visumax 500 from Carl Zeiss. The availability of a single platform was disadvantageous for both doctors and the patients because some of the cost benefits were negated by the high cost of the treatment packs and treatment licenses. And innovation is limited only by one particular platform's limitations. And therefore, it is said that imitation is the best form of flattery. So now newer platforms are available based on similar findings. So we now have something which is known as CLEAR, which is by the Schwinn platforms, the Zimmer Z8 uh, does this. I have borrowed this particular video from my dear friend, Dr. Kumar Doctor, uh, who has started doing it in Mumbai. Here you make two incisions, one to reach the top plane, the other one to reach the bottom. This makes the mistake of uh, uh, finding the correct planes uh, to the minimum. You can easily find the two planes and the separation is almost equivalent to what you would have with a Visumax. We need more work to make sure that the results are uniformly the same. Also the energy parameters need to be studied a little more and that comes only with more, more people doing it. So you can see that the separation is pretty smooth and nice. So just a different platform performing almost uh, the similar thing. And from the other side, you can reach the bottom. For paucity of time, I'll just move forwards. We also have a Visumax 800, which has iris registration, which can com uh, compensate for cyclotorsion alignment. And the whole procedure gets over within a blink of an eye. And therefore, the chances of suction loss and everything is much less. So it makes the procedure very simple. Uh, there is also a system uh, called Silk, which is by Alcon. And this is a small incision lenticule keratomalusis. Uh, this is, uh, again, a new uh, way of doing the same thing, which is uh, getting done at Bangalore with Dr. Roy Chetty and also at Delhi with Dr. Maipal Sajdev at Center for Sight. It also comes with more advantages, learning from what we didn't have before, and therefore making the procedure much uh, more acceptable to a greater uh, uh, population. So we are really looking forward to a bright future for lenticular extraction. The availability of different platforms will expand the potential pool of the physician and will expand options for patients. 
And as a collective, our bargaining uh, position will also improve with the hardware manufacturers. And innovation in this area will expand the possibilities and will not be restricted to the limitation of only one particular platform. So I thank you all for your, uh, for your uh, pr present listening. And uh, thank you very much, IPOS, for this great honor. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. That was a wonderful insight about this, the coronary refractive surgery. Thank you, madam. We'll, c we'll bring that plate. Next lecture is by uh, in the in the field of glaucoma. So, Dr. Santi Sri Ram, sir, uh, I think uh, he needs no introduction. He was a very famous um, uh, glaucoma specialist. He is from the uh, city of Vizag, uh, Andhra Medical College uh, student. Then uh, he was the ex alumni of the RP Center Ames. Then went to US. And then uh, for a brief period, <laughs> he was with the LV Prasad Eye Institute. He was one of the, uh, the instrumental in forming the LV Prasad Eye Institute. And now uh, on his name, we installed a lecture called the Sunt Sri Ram's Glaucoma Lecture. And this year, it's none other than our uh, president of APOS, uh, Dr. Famously called as Dr. G. R. Reddy, uh, are the G. R. Reddy of fields. Now I think he has moved from he is with the time he also changed uh, his quote. Now he is moved into he want to add one more title of G. R. Reddy of fields and O. C. T. Uh, G. R. Reddy's uh, full name is Ramchandra Reddy Reddy Gudimetla. And uh, he was uh, one of the famous uh, teacher, the son, and uh, he has several brothers. Everyone is highly placed and successful one. And now I think he has passed the same battalion to his next generation also. And now he's very passionate about the glaucoma and the especially the investigative part. And he was the recipient of several awards. Now, I think without wasting much time, I introduce Dr. G. R. Reddy to the audience. Now I request uh, our president-elect, Dr. V. V. L. N. sir, to give a plaque to Dr. G. R. Reddy. The time is uh, 12, 12 minutes for the lecture, and uh, after 11 minutes, there will be a beep, beep, and then after 12 minutes, uh, the scientific committee has set a standard thing, the, the, um, the slides will be cut off automatically. Please uh, cooperate with us uh, to maintain the time uh, sincerity. Thank you. At the onset, uh, my sincere thanks to the APOS and especially the scientific committee chairman, Madhu, for uh, asking, this, uh, asking me to deliver the lecture on uh, Sunti Sri Ram, uh, who is a famous uh, glaucoma man. Uh, I selected uh, the topic is functional and structural correlation of the retinal ganglia and cell in glaucoma. I am fortunate enough to have the visual fields then uh, fundus camera and the OCT, set as 6000, and uh, with a JIS form software, which can uh, correlate all the three and can give the printout in a single format.
shoot him now. The most important slide of the talk, if you imagine, we can't substitute the disk evaluation. This disk evaluation is the most important part. We have to suspect glaucoma, then only the role of OCT comes into play. The plan of my talk is topographic relation of uh, retinal ganglion cell uh, RNFL at the disk with the help of OCT deviation maps and the thickness values of the ganglion cell ma at the macula and correlating with RNFL, the thickness at the calculating circle. And I will be telling the role of OCT, what is the role in advanced case of glaucoma, established case of glaucoma and uh, glaucoma suspect. The most important part is, if you see the topographic relation, where the ganglion loss will be there, usually the ganglion loss, we think that if it is in the macular area, the central fibers, the macular papillary bundle, they involve here. And if you observe, the temporal part of the fiber, they come and occupy at the uh, five o'clock position, if it is in the left eye. And the peripheral fiber will occupy at the six o'clock. And the, this correlation, what you should know, and the, here in this, uh, this thing, visual fields will help us the exact uh, the location of the field effect. Here we have to imagine, and that is the major advantage of the visual fields over the city. Now, if you see this one, this is six o'clock, and the fibers enter in five o'clock, and this is the macular papillary bundle. And uh, if you see the major involvement of the peripheral fibers and the macular fibers, which are occupying in this location, and this is the commonest zone where the mac, the MAC zone, the vulnerable zone, macular vulnerable zone will be there. And that is why we, most of the glaucomas will have upper field effect. The reason being the fovea is situated at a lower down and most of the fibers will be crowded here when compared to the upper segment. That is why we will get the more the field effect in the upper part. And coming to the If you observe, the redness appear, usually the normal values, if you see 107, 133, this is the 55 and this is the 55 and the temporal aspect. When it reaches 80, the red appears. Here, when it reaches the micron thickness of 45, the red appears. Here, the micron level comes to 30, the red appears. And here also, both the segments, the micron level thickness and 80, the red appears. And if you see the ganglion cell thickness, actually the ganglion cell thickness is measured on either side seven degrees and on uh, horizontally the, this vertical five degrees. So it won't measure entire 10 dash two. It is measuring only the five degrees on either vertically and seven degrees horizontally. And if you see the normal values are around 90, the highest. And when it reaches 70 micron level, yellow appears and it tells that it is present in the p-value, less than 5%, and this less the, uh, uh, the red appears, the p-value 1%, and 68, and up to 75, it is a green. So, the, with this background, now we will study, I took actually the advanced case of glaucomas, and in the advanced case of glaucoma, the last two fibers to go is, the macular papillary bundle. This is the macular papillary bundle of the right eye. And these are the last fibers to go. And if you see, here they all look similar, but if you see the, uh, the ganglion cell thickness, you see here the 72 also, it is r thin, uh, normal, but if you see this one, so in, when you see compare, this is relatively a more safer advanced case of glaucoma. And uh, the macular papillary bundle is last to go, and if you see, at 44, there are absolute glaucoma, uh, zeros are there, 
But the macular propeller bundle, even though it is 44, it got great, good retinal sensitivity. That is the reason why the macular papillary bundle is last to go. The most important concept is You see, when they, even though all the segments are red, when it is above 60, the retinal sensitivity is very good. It is 62, though red, the retinal sensitivity here is good. 59, the retinal sensitivity is also good. 72, absolutely almost they are normal. So the red and the GCC, it doesn't mean that it is actually the loss of sensitivity is very severe. So then, the mo then what is the role of CoCT in established case of glaucoma? See, the, I actually introduced a new term. This is the established case of glaucoma, and if the patient is not given the treatment, this appears to be a normal field, will become a glaucomitis. So I call it as pre-perimetric zone of perimetric glaucoma. And if you observe, you see, this case and this case, and because the values are more than around 55, though red, there appears to be normal in the field. But if you see, this is also looking normal, but this ganglion cell thickness is 76, 91, and 102. Here, if you see the 55, 55, 55, so even though they are looking same, this case actually requires ag aggressive treatment when compared to this eye. That is the role of OCT and SRV. I will give some examples. See, this is another example where the primary perimetric zone of uh, perimetric glaucoma, you, have, you see, they are 78, 79, 83. So they got very good thickness. Therefore, you, you need not be very aggressive in this case to how to save this existing, uh, the lower part of the glaucoma. In this case, it is also 80, 80 79, and 70. So according to the thickness, you can plan the management. Here, 68, 71, and 77, and this is a macular papillary bundle. This is normal here, 77. And uh, you, from that, you can plan the treatment. Take, for example, this case. Though this case is looking almost similar to other cases and, and appears more stable than other cases, and if you see the thickness, it came to 67, 68, and 73, and looking normal. But in this case, you must be very aggressive. The most important point is the ganglion cell thickness around 60, even though red, around 60, also they look normal. But when it reaches around 47, 48, it becomes absolute. So you must be, you must know what is the thickness of the ganglion cell thickness, and you have to plan the treatment. See this case, and almost 54, 54, 61, and in no time, this is a 48, 49, you see they became absolute, absolute, and here some retinal sensitivity is there, and so the val knowing the values and giving the plan of treatment is very, very vital. So you th don't think that OCT is required for early diagnosis of glaucoma, OCT is required for the management to plan the treatment in an established case and even advanced case and glaucoma suspect. Now the glaucoma suspect, almost I'm seeing uh, some arcade twin defect somewhere suspected on the basis of little rise in IOP. And you see the la values are 75, 79, 67. That is why almost both are looking normal. Even this RNFL analysis is also looking normal. but. Here it started in GCA, we could see it is a 67. This is another case, almost fields and OCT looking normal, even uh, RNFL looking normal, but when you see GCA, the thickness 67, 71, and here that are playing. And if you compare this 70, how much loss is there, 67, how much, this is the values, and this is within this thing, this is the ganglion cell thickness 
you my jet is recognized in situation and this is also patient actually and if you see the normal and uh, this patient also you have to even though they are normal the gc is giving an indication and if you have strong suspicion here i am suspecting some rnfl defect here and we may correlate so this patient actually suspected and uh, you see looking at suspicion and the, you can see there is a pan map the, both the maps will be over, overcome and this can overlaid and you can see the track and this is corresponding even though this is normal absolutely normal and if you see the fields are so ocp plays a very important role by overlapping the deviation map of both if you see the deviation map of both even uh, looking normal this patient is also going to become you see this is a suspected area and this is a suspected area and the most important part is see this case this case even the very red and this patient is going to become uh, very advanced in no time if you don't give aggressive treatment thank you thank you dr reddy the next lecture is uh, dr sundar ramraju's uh, cataract uh, lecture and dr sundar ramraju was the one of the senior most practitioner from bimoram yeah, he was the first generation then uh, i think second generation then now the fourth generation people are there dr pawan please come come on to the desk the request of the recipient he is the grandson of dr sundar ramraju so he was the one of the earliest adopter of the iol technology in those days uh, he conducted uh, iol course in bemvaram and invited people from chennai and other places so that was his deal so on his name uh, his son dr uh, g sachinayan raju from bemvaram is also another famous uh, ophthalmologist and cataract surgeon he is initiated this session and this year we are grateful and thankful to dr kasu prasad reddy sir now i invite to reddy garu to please come on to the dais and uh, actually dr kp reddy needs no introduction i think uh, everyone knows about him but uh, as a formality he is a founder and co chairman of the maxivision super specialty eye hospital and a superhuman effort of completing Uh, one lakh fifty thousand technologically advanced eye operations. The research ophthalmology introduced LASIK to UK and India, and the first person to do the prototype research for the Technolas Bosch and Lam, and Munich, Germany, for the flags. And his uh, prime time of life the lessons were from UK and from 1978 to 1999. He has several research uh, papers, and uh, with this introduction, I invite him to receive his plaque from his uh, the Dr. Sundaram Raju's grandson. And our Reddy also please to join us here. Now I invite him to deliver the lecture. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me, Pawan. Please thank your dad for me. And um, it's wonderful to be here in front of all you guys who are extremely informed in modern ophthalmology. And more importantly, I'm very happy to be here in front of Rupal Shah. 
you all heard, you know, what she has done. I would like to sing praises, but there's a time constraint, so I'll go straight to the topic. It's actually about refractive cataract surgery because this is a cataract surgery um, oration lecture. So you need, uh, you know, mentors in life. So this is what uh, people like Rupal, myself, you know, all the other uh, people with the gel, you know, dream is not the thing you see in sleep, but is that thing that doesn't let you sleep is uh, Kalamji saying, and I followed it. Now, very quickly, I don't need to introduce you to refractive laser techniques, but uh, Rupal, can you listen for one minute? Because this is a compliment for you. I am the guy who introduced LASIK in England and here, but today, 98% of my surgeries are only smile, starting from 0.75 to 8, 8 diopters. The reason being, all the medical legal cases in the universe are uh, flap related. Everything, whether it is epithelial in growth or whether it is dry eyes, you know, even certain issues uh, that led to, you know, some famous girls committing suicide because of uh, LASIK. That is what I was known for, LASIK. But we're all moving. Technology is moving day by day. Here are my glasses. This is technology. Just to show you technology, I'm wearing those. Actually, I experimented on my own eye. I'll come back to that a little later. So I just want to impress upon you that while we have all these weapons in our hands, it is extremely important to be very conservative. So I was blessed to do so many things in life in ophthalmology, but the basics don't change. This is a slide prepared by one of my colleagues, Dr. Alpa, and uh, she said uh, corneal topography evaluation for refractive surgery is very important because our wrong judgments can lead to corneal ectasia. We actually did a study in the year 2015 together and uh, did you know, some 2,168 cases. We studied, we evaluated them. And out of them, only 1,410 were you know, suitable, meaning only 65% were suitable. So be careful with the cornea is what I would like to share with the youngsters because today you have all kinds of pressures on us. We have aggregators, you know, people uh, who jump upon us <clears throat> to take our own patients away and uh, do not consider cornea at all. Just do whatever they want to, you know. Every cornea is being lasered. Please stay away from that. You could get into trouble. So just to, uh, again, the bottom thing, the rejection rate for uh, laser refractive surgery is from that day till today is almost 35%. Just remember that. Then I want to go into cataract surgery because patients and their expectations, you know, because I started uh, cataract surgery, a phaco emulsification when I was a 50 year old, studying a small book of Dr. Mahipal Sachdev. But since then I have done large numbers, but now, what your patients are expecting is not simple cataract surgery. They want cataract refractive surgery. Nobody wants to wear glasses. That is because the forces of marketing that we all did for refractive corneal surgery, like LASIK, okay? But then, I did in my life, originally general surgery, then orthopedics for four years, then neurosurgery. Then I came to ophthalmology, unlike all of you. So I was like an elderly primate to pregnancy to ophthalmology. So I started running and got where I got, thanks to God Almighty. But then I realized ophthalmologists are perfectionists in comparison to other specialities. In orthopedics, a bone can be little this way, that way, but it will mold. In ophthalmology, the patient gets to know immediately. And then we like to deliver the best results with premium technology. And uh, that ultimately uh, improves our uh, you know, practice. 
Then in 2010, I was very, very fortunate, and uh, this is a talk I picked from uh, when I first delivered in 2010 to ECOS in, uh, uh, <coughs> in, in, in US. This is ECOS, is, uh, American European Congress of Ophthalmic Surgeries. And uh, my beginning with uh, femtolaser with the Technolos Bashan was 2010. Now I use a catalyst machine. Fortunately, I have experience of two to compare with. And uh, then I realized that uh, there are so many techniques. I went to Bogota to, do, to learn intracar, tried intracar, and then realized it doesn't work, so quickly moved to supracar, which is born from intracar. And then with all the technologies, if you see in that uh, corner, I, I, I literally begged this company, WaveTech, in that period of time, in 2012-13, a company called WaveTech, I brought the intraoperative abrometry to India. And uh, I remember today that in Mumbai, when I was first made my talk on intraoperative aerometry. Rupal Shaw was chairing the session and asked me, Dr. Reddy, where do you find all these things? Okay, but somehow it came across me and I pleaded with the company and brought it back. And then, with that in my hand, you know, with all the beautiful, you know, modern uh, intraocular lenses, femtolasers and um, excimer lasers, and then, intraoperative aerometry. Literally, you can do your A-scan on the table. I coined a word called phacotechmix or phacomix. Uh, basically, you do your uh, uh, flax outside the theater, then take them, do and do a mix inside the theater, and then check it on the table with the aura and put, put your lens in. There ends the matter. But supposing after three months, patient is not happy because of some residual power, you could touch it up with a LASIK, PRK, smile also today, okay? So with all these things, with this technology, and we have take aura, what are the real bugbears? The biggest unknown clinical parameter in IOL power calculation is the effective lens position, but with, with aura and the modern uh, IOL masters that we have, that's not an issue at all. But then, when it comes to, again, it's, you know, manual and uh, fem flax, femtolaser-assisted capsulotomies, you get fantastic exact overlap, you know, a beautiful uh, uh, centration and diameter and circularity. So all that will lead you to a, a better outcomes. But then in all this, imagine in a pediatric child, you know, I found in 2010, it was fantastic you get a beautiful capsulotomy. But don't forget incisions. I found manual incisions are better than the, exam, the femtolaser incisions. Because I found in an, if, if there is a 90 degrees incision, corneal incision, you get up to one diopter easily corrected astigmatism, but not the temporal incision that is astigmatic neutral. So you can see how beautiful that is. And then you can see how uh, neatly you can uh, remove, uh, you know, the, the, the capsulotomies. And you can see a, in an intumescent cataract on the other side, it will uh, literally, you can simply suck it out and not bother. I never do a, um, a, a hydro dissection in any of these cases or any of my, anything above grade three, above I don't do, you know, hydro dissection. So you get beautiful, you know, not only capsulotomy, but also excellent lens fragmentation. If you look to your left, you know, I mean, look at all those brown, hard cataracts. You can, you know, manage anything. So we really don't need a crystal ball. The past and the present taught all of us the cataract surgery of tomorrow. And uh, it's getting very exciting and promising. Machines are getting better and incisions are getting smaller, and IOLs are outperforming. Right now, I am uh, doing some small work for a company called LensGen in California. This is on the Jubin Accommodative IOL. I've done about 20 cases till today. And believe me, it, it, it's got a fascinating future. 
and uh, that is my present situation. I've had many visitors come in at the time, and uh, lastly, my personal remar remarks, uh, that flax for capsulotomy and nuclear fragmentation is an excellent milestone uh, in refractive cataract surgery. Reproducibility of centration, circula circularity, and diameter. And I'm sure surgeons will adopt to the new technology and, uh, you know, I proved in those days that uh, in 2010 when I was experimenting, I did a school teacher in the morning flags and evening surgery. Then Tamil Nadu ophthalmologists, when they invited me, I took my friend, I did uh, flags in Hyderabad, took two nurses along with me, flew to Chennai, you know, with an eye that was already operated, and uh, did a life surgery there, just proving a fact that you don't need to immediately, you can wait. Meaning, if you don't have this machine, you can go to a neutral center or, and then uh, get a femtolaser assisted cataract surgery. So once again, thank you very much, Dr. Gopal Razu. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Yes, sir, please, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. So next we have Dr. Uh, U.V. Ramanraju Karnia Lecture by none other than uh, the next incoming president of AOS, Dr. Samar Basak, sir. He is the founder, director, and head of Karnia and Eye Bank Services, Disha Eye Hospital, Calcutta. That's the largest eye care provider in Eastern India with 18 branches. Currently, President-elect AOS, 10 awards from AOS, including the prestigious P. Sivaradi International Award in 2022, Professor L.P. Agarwal Oration in Ames, and Professor I.S. Jain Award from PGI, Senior Achievement Award Academy AAO 2015, Best of the Show Video Award not once or twice, but six times at the Academy, and best paper in Cornea at the Academy again in 2020, best video in ESCRS two times, and ASCRS in 2015. Publications, he has published nine books and 52 papers in peer-reviewed international journals. His surgical interest is high volume keratoplasty, including complex surgeries like DMEC and Boston K-Pro. He usually performs around 250 keratoplasties every year is obsessed with DMEC in the recent years and performs more than 200 of them every year. And he has, over a period of short span of seven years, performed more than seven of such things. As a hobby, he has something very interesting called as the optophilately that stamps in ophthalmology. We are honored to have you with us in APOS to deliver this lecture, sir. I request you to receive this citation from Dr. U.V. Ramanraj Garu and our president, Dr. G.R. Reddy Garu. Please come forward to receive the citations. Thank you, uh, Dr. Modu, and uh, thank you all for this uh, wonderful meeting and kind introduction. I'll be telling something about endothelial keratoplasty and beyond. I do not have any financial interest in any of the subject matter. So endothelial keratoplasty means corneal endothelial dysfunction. So if you have any disease of corneal endothelial dysfunction, the only answer is endothelial keratoplasty. So these are the few indications. Commonest indication in our country is seraphic bullous keratopathy. Then we have, of course, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy. We have eye syndrome, failed disect graft, viral endotheliitis, and post-PK failed graft. So 25 years back, only option for Fuchs 
or PBK or PK. Then we all know all the disadvantages of PK like delayed rehabilitation. Even in spite of best uh, optical result, you will have the astigmatism of close to 9 or 10 after astigmatism. And these are irregular astigmatism. Patient will not able to get good vision. Then there are further uh, problems like surface and suture problems, more chances of rejection or infection, greatest risk of trauma and wound dehiscence, frequent and long follow-up, long-term steroid, and more graft failure. So if you go back, then the evolution of endothelial keratoplasty procedures came, and it started from 1996, and gradually is improved to current level of DMEC. And you know that this is the year of US, where 2011-12, where the endothelial keratoplasty surpluses penetrating keratoplasty. Though DMEC is now the choice of endothelial keratoplasty surgery, but in some eyes, still we need to do DSEC advanced Fuchs dystrophy, poor visibility, post-tube uh, shunt, post-VR surgery, some of the PK, post-PK eyes, large irectomy or aphakia, or any other eyes where DMEC is difficult. Like this, we have advanced Fuchs dystrophy that we can do, DSEC and patients can have very good vision without any suture and with less amount of astigmatism. Well, this is my teacher, my ENT teacher, during my MBBS days, one-eyed, and he has this problem. And I did uh, this DSAEK with bleb repair, and they, she died recently, but the post-op results after three years is doing good. And this is also possible with uh, endothelial uh, endotheliitis, HSV endotheliitis, and one, again one-eyed people. DMEC is difficult, this kind of cases, but DSEC can be done along with FACO in these cases. Post-PK therapeutic keratoplasty is also a very good indication for DSEC or DMEC, but DSEC is very easier in this case, and these patients can go further without uh, any problem. This was my fourth case in my life, 2006. Now going for 17 years, you know that that DSEC is very, going very good and 6-6 six, six part vision with a good endothelial cell count even after 17 years of 1400 cell count. Then what is wrong with the DSEC? Wrong is that we are adding 8200, 20 micron more tissue. It is not anatomically perfect also not visually, and increased chances of higher order abrasions. So now DMEC, pre-op ASOCT, if you see in the left hand side, immediately day one you see that cornea is drastically reduced by almost half thickness. So it is perfectly anatomical, chances of getting back your 2020 vision is much more higher, almost in the tune of 60% of our patients get back 2020 vision. So, a mange more. So, if you see the data of US keratoplasty scenario, this is all EK in US. In the recent years, you see there is gradual and very high transformation towards DMEC. And uh, this is uh, almost in the, this year, it will, the dis, DMEC will surplus DSEC again. But in India, we are almost 100 surgeons are doing EK regularly. And last 10 to 12, 20 years, they, we are slowly increasing our numbers. This is the, our EBAI data. If you see the pre-COVID and post-COVID era, you will see distinct difference between two. That, but still, we are in the 2020-23, we are doing almost, uh, 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 you see, if you put this together almost 4,500, whereas our total figure is 28,000. So again, this was a published in 13-14, uh, 
and that time the EK number was 12 percent and this is Indian data and if you see the 20 223 data, it is just 16 percent. We are not much increased in last 10 years, only 4 percent increase of EK data. If you see this curve, this also total EK is 4,500, but because of supply of pre-cut tissue that DSEC is gradually increasing, but DMEC is not increasing in last six years. It is from almost double, but it is not that big number. Indication of Western world, it is 80 percent like Fuchs dystrophy and pseudophagic there is like between 15 to 20 percent. But in India, the PBK is the commonest indication from 42 to 75 percent in different series. Fuchs dystrophy is from 15 to 40 percent and others are there. So there are different surgical pearls. This is mode of technical the uh, different DMAC is of course difficult uh, to do it, uh, but uh, the all the uh, steps are different, patient selection are different. There are certain stages you need to be more careful, and also the uh, the post-operative regimen, immediate post-operative regimen. So donor unfolding, everything is dif difficult. So DMAC as a whole. That is a difficult from DSEC. So if you see these two pictures, same patient, two eyes, one eye I did DSEC to 13, and, and another eye I have done DMEC, and it is just post of two weeks, and the patient is having six, six vision, and it's a very good, very highly satisfying for the patient and the surgeon. And these are the specular figure and you see that specular figure even after uh, uh, more than five years and you see the specular figure uh, in the DMEC is much, much higher. So safety and outcome, the DSEC and DMEC both goes hands by hand. Overall graph survival after DMEC 92%, 200% at least a follow up of 68, more than five years, and now the long data is available after 10 months, and also the 10 months results are, uh, are coming very good. So DMAC seems to be superior to DSEX and to induce less refractive error, similar to surgical uh, uh, risk, and endothelial cell loss is also comparable to DSEC. DSEC learning curve is stiff, but DMAC learning curve is very stiff. Then. There are other alternative automated, as the DMAC learning curve is very steep, then alternative came as also EK, this ultra thin or UTD sec. The thickness of the graft is 51 to 100 micron, nano thin or NTD sec, that is less than 50 micron. The donor tissue handling is much, much easier than DMAC, where the thickness of the tissue is 14 to 18 micron. Then there are also concept of hybrid DMEC. So better all because of DMEC tissue handling is difficult. So these are the alternative method where you can use more easily to unfold the tissue. PDEC is another concept popularized by Agarwal group. And they, their mean uh, graph thickness is about 28 micron. So it is again thicker than DMEC. And the advantage is you can also use as a younger donor. But uh, we have a limited experience, and maybe because of uh, learning curve is little problem, many people could not adapt this uh, PDEC. Then hemidemic and quaterdemic, because of shortage of tissue all over the world, every country, so we need to increase our donor pool, so there is a concept of hemidemic and quaterdemic popularized by same Millis group. And DMET also, desmet membrane endothelial transfer, this has also been seen that it is possible, but long-term results are not good. Then what next? Next is, specifically for Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, can we go without endothelial keratoplasty, what is called DUEC or DSO. 
Desmet or is without endothelial keratoplasty and desmet stripping only without taking any graft. I have limited experience and there are several evidences in literature. It works in some of the FECD cases like central FECD. Periphery is fine. So there must be very good selection of the cases, central or fo central Fuchs distribute with central focal edema, near or near normal peripheral with good cell morphology. Patient have intolerable glare, reduction of BCVA, and you can use it for both phakic and pseudophakic. Otherwise, it's a good candidate for DMAC. It may work alone, or it may work with ROC inhibitor or ROC kinase inhibitor drops. So I started this in 2017, and this was my first case. Other eye, I did DMEC. And you see that in the left eye, I did DUAC. This is uh, day one, not happy. But after one month, the graft clear. And here only, only you need to strip off four millimeter zone from the central area. So these patients are doing fine. And you see this. A picture where it is not the coming there. Oh. If you see the, the uh, uh, retro illumination, there is a gap in the desmets, and that is the area I have removed without doing any keratoplasty. And if you see the ASOCT, the central part is thinner DM. There only the endothelium is there, not DM endothelial complex. So this is three month BSCVA 66 specular. Uh, I mean, you can get specular, but you are not happy with the specular. This is a dramatic in my second case. You see that both eyes of the patient, I did in the patient left eye, the DUEC, and right eye, DMEC. And if you see this, the left eye, day one, day seven, month one, two months, six months, and nine months, the cornea gradually clears without doing any keratoplasty procedure. And this is the final, they see that after one year of DUEC and two years after DMEC, both looks good, six by six in both the patients. And if you see the area of gap in the central red glow, you see there is a definite gap is there, that is the area of desmetorexis. But this patient failed after 15 months. You see the corneal edema has been increased I, I, I bought this from Japan, and this is Glanatech eye drop, Rokinase inhibitor, uh, that five years back now in our country, Rokinase inhibitor is also there. Uh, that is uh, two months I used it. Again, the cornea gets cleared, but you see that the DMEC, you, 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 DUEC, you don't like the image of specular. If you compare with the right eye of the patient after two and a half years and left eye after 15 months, you do not like the picture of the left side of the specular. And this is another patient, third duet, and it never cleared. You see the edema still persistent. This patient ran away from me. Fourth patient also cleared, but during this COVID period, all the patients lost to follow up from me. But again, they come back after the COVID, and I saw three of them failed. Only one patient is surviving, and that to the corneal edema is much higher, almost 60 micron higher than the other pre-COVID era. So these are some of the picture, and one picture, you see there is no specular image also, after four years of DUEC. So, People are, now the reports are coming, the recurrence of gut theta, endothelial dysfunction after successful DUEC or DSO, and other groups are also publishing long-term results. The results you will not like, it is okay, fine, but as compared to DMEC, it is nothing. So at this point, the basic question comes, what is the pathogenesis of Fuchs? Is it a DMEM disease or it is an endothelial cell disease? Then what actually gut data are? It is the excrescence of DM, which we have taught from our early ages. Or it is a deposition of some retroplasmic endothelial, whatever substances of diseased endothelium. 
there are also genetic factors involved in it. So in some group it is working, some group it is not working. Also the, if you consider the pathophysiology of folks, the environmental factor is also there. So genetic and environmental food habit, all this will come with the pathogenesis of Fuchs dystrophy. So DA, is it helpful in Fuchs? Probably no. Possibly it can delay the DMAC procedure for two to four years. That is my conclusion. And then what? This is the last three slides. Minimally invasive procedure, injection of cultured endothelial cells. The Kinoshuta, good friend of mine, and he published this in 2018, that cultured endothelial cells from the peripheral part, cultured, and the patients are lying down, head down. In DMEC or DSEC, we ask the patient in supine position. Here it is in the prone position. You brush the endothelial DM surface, put hundred thousands of endothelial cells from the culture plate, and then wait. And they have shown very beautiful picture of this patient, a series of uh, patients they have published in New England Journal, and patients, 11 patients, and they are all doing good. And they have recently published the five years follow-up data of this patient, and you see the endothelial confocal microscopic picture, some of them are doing excellent. Probably one donor cornea can cure 300 diseased cornea with endothelial dysfunction. So this is probably will be the future. Maybe, we'll, maybe it will come to our country maybe after 10 years or 15 years. So overall endothelial dysfunction, the possibility are some of the are highly invasive like DSEC, DSAEK, ultra thin or nano thin DSEC or DMEC. In the, this is on the late stage, early stage. You can have drug therapy like rokinase inhibitor. People are trying only with rokinase inhibitor or with the endothelial culture therapy. So take home message is in India, we have to do a lot of EK in any form. In the last few years, we are doing more than 6.5 million cataract surgery per year. That means every year we are adding almost 13 to 15,000 new EK patient as a form of PBK. We have also Fuchs dystrophy, especially in Eastern India, and surgical and visual outcome of any dis DSEC, manual DSEC, DSAEK are same. DMEC is a new area with excellent outcome, and newer innovation like drug, cell culture, or DWEC are exciting. We will be looking for it. Thank you very much for your patience sharing. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so next in this uh, series of lectures, next we have the Learn From Master series. And this year we are very proud to present this lecture to Dr. Chandrasekhar Sankuratri. Uh, recently he also received the Padma Sri Award from Government of India. Congratulations, sir. This is in one of the most heinous terror attacks in 1985, Air India Flight 182. Dr. Chandrasekhar lost his entire family, wife and two children to this deplorable bombing. Over the next three years, he struggled, slowly picking himself up from this personal loss. He gave up his job and life in Canada, came to India in 1988 to set up his work for the downtrodden in Kakinada, Andhra Pradesh, founding the Manjari Sankuratri Memorial Foundation, MSMF in Canada, in memory of his lost family. After his earlier education in India, he pursued MS in biology from Memorial University St. John's in 1979, PhD in zoology from University of Alberta, Edmonton in 1974. From 1975 to 1998, he worked in various roles from being visiting scientist at the Pacific Biological Station and scientific evaluator at the Health Ministry and Welfare. Canada, however, the tragedy struck him challenging the, his strength and resilience. He's devoted his time and wealth to the service of humanity. Dr. Chandrasekhar Sankaratri has been working to address two distinct and much neglected needs in rural India, quality eye care and excellent education for all through his organization. He has received several awards and now he is the founder and lead at the Srikaran Institute of Ophthalmology, Kakinada, Andhra Pradesh and founder director of Sarada Vidyalayam. 
He has transformed his personal tragedy into a legacy of compassion and service, providing quality eye care education to the underserved. His efforts have garnered international recognition, earning him prestigious awards, including the honorary doctorate from Newfoundland, Canada, outstanding humanitarian service from the Canadian Ophthalmological Society, Karamvir Puraskar, and is also a Paul Harris Fellow, and as I've already told you, a recent Padmasri awardee. We are honored to have you with you, sir. We request you to come over to the dais. I request uh, Dr. Raman Garu, the president, uh, GR Reddy, sir, and the incoming president, Dr. VVLM, sir, to, yeah, to please come and uh, hand over the citation to Dr. S. Chandrasekhar, sir, and then, sir, we'll give his lecture. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I feel it's my privilege and I'm happy to be here on this AOS conference that too, being a non-ophthalmologist, I feel it's very honored to be here to share the journey of our institute, Seeker and Institute of Ophthalmology for the last 30 years. Sankaratri Foundation was established with a mission to improve the quality of life of poor and downtrodden. And we have opted for three sources to implement our vision. One is education to the rural poor children. Second is quality eye care to prevent blindness. And is disaster relief to assist the families and the victims at the time of natural disasters. And we also organize community events for the welfare of the people. And we want to be a role model in the community so that the community will take over the responsibility in future. Sikran Institute of Haftalamadu established in 1993. It's very interesting why a biologist came into the eye care. This is due to my childhood friend, Dr. V.K. Raju, who used to always talk about eye problems, and that's what motivated me to stand in, the, with, in front of you today and share my journey. And the vision is to eliminate avoidable blindness through providing accessible, affordable, and equitable quality I care. You are the four pillars of our organization, blended with core values like compassion, dignity of labor, empathy, transparency, teamwork, dedication, with perseverance and empowering people, especially women. We started as a small surgical center to provide eye care, especially in the rural areas, because I realized that many rural areas do not have access to quality eye care. This was the reason I have selected a small rural area outside Kakinada also. And we introduced IOL since 1993, and maybe the first one to introduce in that region. Not only that, we initiated community outreach programs in the area that 
for the guidance of Dr. Venkat Swami from Arvind Eye Hospital. And he is my real role model. And we followed that model since then. We are the first one to introduce SACS for cataract surgeries and never look back. We found that was a very cost effective and fast surgery techniques to reach the rural masses. Based on the demand, the small hospital has grown uh, slowly. This was all organic growth. And any innovation in the eye care was introduced in the region. Most important is we gained the trust of the patients and assured the credibility in the organization. We became a translator in the community outreach programs. Now evolved into a center of excellence with all specialties, teaching programs, and also combined with the research. And at present, we are the biggest chain of eye care hospitals in the region with one tertiary eye care hospital in Kakinada and three secondary centers where we perform the cataract surgeries and 10 primary centers to realize our mission of providing accessible eye care to the rural populations. Over the last 30 years, we could provide outpatient services to more than 3.8 million patients from at least four or five districts of Andhra Pradesh and performed over 3,45,000 3, surgeries, out of which 90% are free to the poor and needy. We have organized over 4,305 community ice screening camps. This is all in the rural and tribal areas. Besides that, we have also educated 90 ophthalmologists within India. All of our doctors who were trained there are spread all over Andhra Pradesh. Some are also outside Andhra Pradesh. In addition to that, we have guided 36 senior residents in ophthalmology from Canada and USA in small incision cataract surgery. They came and learned from us. Some of them found it very useful for them. In addition to that, we have educated over 439 ophthalmic assistants. Again, thanks to Dr. Venkat Swami for suggesting me to take rural people with a 12th class background and customize the training for them. And we did it. We were very successful. Our technicians were again spread all over India. Some are in outside India now. We have educated over 2007 office personnel. And we are also accredited hospital in patient safety and quality care by NABH three years ago. The reason we trained all these doctors, paramedical personnel, and managers were, when we first came to India, I found out most of the people are not suitable to my requirements, our mission, so we have trained our own people. It's a very rewarding task, but difficult but it's worth it. Several recognitions came, especially from Canada and USA, and I don't need to go through all those things and all that. Most interesting one is the recognition from the Canadian Ophthalmology Society for our services. Several volunteers from Canada and USA came and has helped us get better gradually in providing the patient care and services.
for our outreach programs, our service to poor and needy people. We have re re received the best NGO award for two years in a row. We have performed close to 17,000 large surgeries in one year. With a small setup, who could do it? So that means if we want to do something, we can do it with a very low cost but high quality services. After 30 years, we are wondering what to do now, but still there is a need to continue the existing programs. As you all know, whatever we did was only scratch of the surface. Still many people need services. Not only now, in the future also, some people will be there looking for our help to restore their vision. So we'll be continuing that. Based on the needs of the region, we are trying to develop an exclusive pediatric eye care center to cater to a population of about 10 million population. As there are no pediatric eye care providers in that region, and that is still in the working, hopefully it will be ready in one more year. With our experience, we noticed that lack of competent ophthalmic assistants is really a need for not only for us, but for all the ophthalmic doctors in and around our hospital, not only in India, but also in the most of the third world countries. So we are planning to start an ophthalmic academy to impart the and en enhance the skills for ophthalmologists, paramedical personnel, and program managers to manage eye hospitals or vision centers. As a part of our social responsibility, we are adopting new methods to save the environment for the future generations. Being a not-for-profit organization, financially, we're always challenged. So ultimately, after 30 years, we are thinking of becoming financial sustainability so that in future, the organization can manage and support their own programs. We hope to be, continues to be a leader in the community around here. In order to save the environment, to reduce the global warming and pollution control, we have adopted single use of plastic consumption and use only the reusable plastics almost for the last 10 years. And we are uh, discouraging the people to use the plastics, including our school children. Interestingly, they are very receptive to any new idea to give to them. So that is the future of our generations. And thank you for the opportunity. I know the time is up. I just want to say one thing here, to be able to do and all these things, God gave us a way. God gave us a way not only through himself, but also through several volunteers, donors, all the doctors who passed through our organization, all the paramedical personnel, and all the support people. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.